Welcome to the OSCE Station Web Lectures. This is the first of a two-part lecture about serum sodium abnormalities. This presentation will focus on how to assess and manage hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is defined as a serum sodium concentration of less than 135, the normal range being between 135 and 145. This is the commonest electrolyte abnormality in hospitalized patients. On the left-hand side of this picture, salt is being added to a small glass of water. On the right-hand side, the same amount of salt is being added to a larger glass. The sodium concentration in the larger glass is less. Now, this may seem obvious, but it's important because the reason why people have a low sodium is because they have more extracellular water and not because they have a reduced sodium. So the underlying pathogenesis of hyponatremia is increased extracellular water. Therefore, it is also important to understand how water balance is controlled. In the top left-hand corner, we have a neuron with its cell body in the hypothalamus. The axon extends down and the hormone ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is secreted from the posterior pituitary where it acts on the collecting ducts in the distal part of the kidney. Here, it causes increased water reabsorption via the insertion of water channels called aquaporins in the membranes of the tubules. To summarize, ADH acts on V2 receptors on renal tubular cells, mediating the integration of aquaporins into the tubular membrane, thereby facilitating the reabsorption of water. At extremely high ADH concentrations, it causes vasoconstriction by binding to V1 receptors on vascular smooth muscle. There are two main stimuli for inducing ADH release from the posterior pituitary. Increased serum osmolality is one, this is sensed by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The increased osmolality also stimulates thirst, which causes a person to drink water to correct the raised osmolality. The second stimulus is a reduced blood volume sensed by the baroreceptors in large vessels such as the carotid and aorta, as well as the atria. These compensatory mechanisms act to stimulate ADH release to ensure homeostasis is maintained. And to summarize once again, Increased water reabsorption causes a drop in sodium concentration. When faced with a patient with an abnormally low sodium, the first thing you do is clinically assess their volume status. You ask yourself, is this patient hypovolemic and do they show any clinical signs of this? Or are they on the other end of the spectrum and hypervolemic with signs of fluid overload? Or maybe is the third option, are they euvolemic? Starting with hypovolemia, we want to pick up the clinical signs of this on examination, so you start with inspection beginning at the hands and moving up in a systematic fashion. Is the pulse rate high? Is there a big difference between the lying and standing blood pressures? Is there any evidence of dry mucous membranes? Or any evidence of reduced tissue turgor? This is tested by gently pinching the skin on the chest and seeing if the skin bounces back quickly or slowly. With reduced skin turgor, it will bounce back slower. If the patient is confused or drowsy, this means there is a reduced cerebral perfusion. If there is a reduced urine output, less than 30 mL per hour, this is usually abnormal. If the patient is hypovolemic, you ask yourself where have they lost the fluid from? Is the cause a renal cause of the volume depletion? Ask the patient if they have been started on diuretics in the last two to three weeks. Or is it an extra renal cause, with volume loss from the GI tract? You can ask about symptoms of diarrhea and vomiting. So this situation can be managed by replacing the lost fluid with 0.9% saline to correct the underlying abnormality. If the patient is not hypovolemic, you ask yourself if they are hypervolemic. So can you see any signs of fluid overload? Is the jugular venous pressure elevated? You can auscultate the back of the lungs to listen for crackles. You can look at the legs. Is there any evidence of pedal edema? Is the patient in heart failure? The causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia involve three main organs. Managing this involves fluid restriction and treating the underlying cause. If the patient is not hypo or hypervolemic, then you need to do some tests to work out the underlying cause of euvolemia. 
you want to check the thyroid status and perform the thyroid function test to see if the patient is hypothyroid. Check the adrenal status with a short synaptin test. This involves giving the patient an injection of synthetic ADH and checking the blood at 30 minutes and 60 minutes to see if the adrenals have been adequately stimulated to produce cortisol. Finally, for SIADH, calculate plasma and urine osmolality. Bear in mind that up until now we have been dealing with appropriate ADH release. For example, in heart failure there is a reduced cardiac muscle contractility and the baroreceptors sense the reduced pressure and stimulate ADH release. This causes an appropriate ADH release. SIADH can be caused by a tumour, for example, which is secreting inappropriate amounts of ADH. Similarly, treating uvolemic hyponatremia involved in fluid restriction, for example, no more than 500 ml of total fluid, including IV and oral intake. Once again, this is treated by treating the underlying cause, so if the patient is hypothyroid, giving them thyroxine replacement, hydrocortisone therapy if adrenal insufficiency is suspected and in cases of SIADH if the patient were given saline then they would absorb all the water and excrete the sodium and this would cause the sodium to drop even further. Saline is only a treatment for hypovolemic hyponatremia. Touching on SIADH briefly there are several causes but only four categories to remember. CNS pathology, you think of any brain disease, traumatic injuries, brain tumours, epilepsy, stroke. The second category is lung pathology, so fibrosis, bronchiectasis, lung abscesses, pneumonias. The third category is drugs, including opiates, carbamazepine, and finally tumours. Further investigations would include a chest x-ray or a CT head to identify the source of the cause of SIADH. SIADH can be diagnosed if the normal stimuli for ADH release are not present and the results for the plasma and urine osmolality. There are some criteria which may be useful to remember. These include sodium of less than 135, a plasma osmolality of less than 270, a urine osmolality of greater than 100 and a urine sodium of more than 20 millimoles. Drugs to consider if fluid restriction doesn't work, demaclocycline, which dampens the responsiveness of renal tubular cells to ADH, and a newer agent called tolvaptan, which acts as a V2 antagonist. This is often used in cases of chronic hyponatremia. Now touching on severe hyponatremia, meaning below 120, the patient will have a reduced GCS and may be fitting. Now this is a medical emergency, and usually hypertonic saline, 3%, is used to correct the abnormality. Correcting low sodium can be dangerous if it's brought up too slowly, and it needs to be drawn in a controlled manner with expert help. Now, the sodium shouldn't be increased by more than 10 millimoles every 24 hours. An increase of greater than this could result in cerebral pontine myelinosis. Now, uh, this is when the sodium is corrected too quickly and you get osmotic demyelination syndrome resulting in clinical features such as pseudobulbar palsy and quadriplegia and this may eventually result in coma and death. So in summary, hyponatremia is a very common case. Initially you have to assess the volume status and treat the underlying cause. Thank you for watching.